talking about how we utilize uh, sugar. Um, diabetes uh, mellitus, of course, uh, type 1 uh, diabetes. We used to call it juvenile onset diabetes, but I'm seeing a ton of this stuff. I see a lot of adults who are developing type 1 diabetes. When I first started in medicine uh, back in the 70s, you never saw that. You never saw it at all. This is, this is something brand new. I have no idea what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. There's a lot of strange things going on uh, because of our, our really crappy diets, um, uh, because of all the processed foods. A lot of things are changing. Um, our lifestyle. <clears throat> I think I told you before that uh, the sperm counts are going down. Oh yeah, you were saying that. Yeah, it's like split in half from what it used to be uh, back uh, before, uh, right around World War One or World War II. Uh, when I first started in medicine, we used to do sperm counts all the time. Um, it was common to have a 350 million uh, per mil sperm count. Now, if you see 100, 180 million, you know it's an oddity. It's, it's, a, it's a really high sperm count. But in the old days, I mean, everybody had high sperm counts. And now all of a sudden, we don't have high sperm counts anymore. And we're not exactly sure why. Uh, of course, this has to do with our diet. Uh, and for this reason, some people, some people just develop a type 1 diabetes. Uh, if this type of diabetes, if you weren't born with it, you didn't get it. it just, you just never developed it. But then again, we used to eat better foods. Yeah. than we do today. We ate more fat. We ate lard. You know, we ate bacon grease. Uh, of course, we died in our 50s back then uh, of lung cancer. But uh, things have changed. Oh, it must be in my other pocket. Uh, so this is type 1 diabetes. The pancreas stops producing insulin, or it never starts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's usually the way it works. Um, I had a, a student at uh, Ashford uh, who had developed uh, type 1 diabetes at age 18. And, and I was going, are you sure it's type 1 diabetes? Is this, isn't it type 2 diabetes? We used, to call, we used to call type 1 juvenile onset and type 2 adult onset of diabetes. Mm. But of course now people are de developing type 1 diabetes uh, in their adulthood. Uh, through the brain, oh, I'm sorry, though the brain can still utilize glucose from the diet, the rest of the body can't, and so it utilizes fat stores instead. So uh, one of the ways that you can uh, uh, diagnose somebody with type 1 diabetes is if they all of a sudden just lose a ton of weight. They get really, really slender. Uh, since most of the dietary glucose uh, cannot be, uh, be used, it passes through the system and it's excreted in the urine. Uh, glucose can also not be converted to glycogen and stored in the liver. Uh, diabetics are hungry because the body tells them to consume energy, but they can't gain weight because they do not store glucose as fat. And this is a problem. I saw this uh, once upon a time uh, when I was working in the lab. We had this old guy came in. Uh, he had type 2 diabetes, but he had developed this type 2, di two, two diabetes, and he didn't even realize it. Uh, but he just, he was so skinny. I mean, he must have had no fat on him at all. Now the weird thing was his daughter, his daughter developed diabetes right at the same time, and she was just so happy that she lost all of her, her baby fat. Uh, she was a, a 19 or 20 year old, uh, really weird, but uh, she had the most god awful breath you can possibly imagine. It was ketones. It was uh, she had ketones on her breath, which is a really nasty has has a really nasty odor. Ketones. It smells like bad breath. It's pretty nasty. Uh, the only treatment for type 1 diabetes is exogenous uh, insulin. Uh, once upon a time, we used to use uh, sheep insulin. Uh, now, of course, we have synthesized it. Uh, and, of course, there are insulin pumps and all kinds of interesting things. We do a really good job of taking care of these people. Uh, they still die young. Uh, because their body is not functioning properly. It's really difficult for them. They have to control their diet. If they don't control their diet, uh, then they will... Uh, I, I mean, normally I, I can eat anything I want because my insulin level 
fluctuates with whatever I eat. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you are a type 1 diabetic, of course, you need, you need a, a proper amount of insulin to take care of whatever you're, you're eating. So I can't, uh, you know, I see a, a, a piece of cake in the, in the store window and I, and I, you know, scarf it down. Uh, of course, these guys can't do that because they would need extra insulin to take care of that sugar. Uh, I think I told you about my friend, uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. This guy had the highest IQ of, of all the people I've ever been around. Uh, but he he wanted to, he wanted to be a he wanted to be a, a beatnik. This was before hippies, okay. and then when hippies came around, he wanted to be a hippie. Uh, and, and his definition of a hippie or a beatnik was somebody that drank. Yeah. Uh, so he wanted to be an alcoholic. Anyway, he died at 39 of, of uh, uh, insulin poisoning. <laughs> he, he used to shoot himself up with extra insulin if he was going to go out and drink. And he would, um, he was really smart. So, I mean, he, his formula was pretty good. And uh, he, he was, he was an alcoholic, uh, and he was able to maintain that despite his diabetes. You know, diabetics can't really drink alcohol because the alcohol turns into sugar in their, in their gut, and they don't. It all depends on, on how much, oh golly, <clears throat> what type of alcohol it is. If it's beer, it turns into a lot of, of fat. Uh, if it's whiskey or vodka or something. And, and he was able to, to figure all this stuff out. He was really good at it until that one night, <clears throat> kind of got things wrong. Uh, I think what happened was he didn't drink as much as, as he thought he was. He passed out. Uh, he was drinking and he passed out and he didn't drink as much as he thought he was, he was going to drink. And so he poisoned him. <laughs> he gave himself too much insulin. Anyway, he died. Uh, diabetes mellitus type 2. Uh, adult onset diabetes is a milder form of diabetes uh, that usually does not affect an individual until they are adults. Uh, there are two causes of this type of diabetes. Uh, the cells gradually lose their sensitivity to insulin, that's what we see a lot. Uh, the body gradually decreases its production of glucose. Uh, of course, that's another type. This type of diabetes is more common among obese people and can usually... Uh, What's well, going from here? Wait a minute. I'll get rid of it. Maybe. And it's gone. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. Uh, because it has to do with uh, uh, being overweight, uh, being obese, uh, you can usually control it with your diet. Uh, I had a sister-in-law that had uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, the way that she controlled it was by not eating anything white because white things have fat. Yeah. Okay, so she didn't drink milk, she didn't eat cottage cheese. Uh, what else didn't she eat? She didn't eat whatever the white sauce is for spaghetti. Alfredo. Alfredo. Yeah, she didn't eat any, anything white. <clears throat> anyway, uh, may, no mayonnaise. Uh, and she was, she was able to control her diabetes until she got depressed. And when she got depressed, guess what she did? She ate white things. <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> okay. And uh, so then she uh, went into crisis. Uh, her kidneys shut down. And uh, they wanted to to give her dialysis, mm -hmm. and she refused, which is the dumbest thing in the world. So about six months later, she was dead. You can't live with, I mean, those are toxins. I mean, that's what, yeah. that's what your kidneys do. They clean out your, to your toxins from your system. And she thought she would just go into a coma and die, but she didn't. It was very painful. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've had my kidneys shut down before. It, is, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. It was, had to do with something else. It had to do with running. Uh, with competing athletes, you know. 
The individual can also take medication that stimulates the pancreas uh, to produce more insulin. Of course, that's metformin uh, that, you, that uh, works on type 2 diabetes. Uh, very common in uh, minority populations, uh, mainly because of the shit that everybody eats. Uh, all the fat that, uh, that people eat, uh, it's easier to eat you know, little Debbie's than uh, you know, have donuts for breakfast or whatever. Uh, really not, real, not, not the best thing in the world to eat. You should be eating fruit for breakfast or whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> um, minorities, uh, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans, uh, there are some tribes uh, the uh, Tejano O'odham, 80% of the popula of that population has has diabetes. It's fairly prevalent on this reservation as well. Yeah. Not nearly as prevalent as it is there, though. Uh, and it it's, it seems to have something to do with uh, I don't know with, with uh, the way uh, people evolved. Uh, if you evolved as meat eaters like the uh, Plains Indians. Uh, they eat a lot of, uh, it's fairly lean meat, now all of a sudden they don't eat that buffalo anymore, they're eating uh, beef. Beef, of course, are, have a lot more fat. So, I don't know. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> so they have a lot of uh, diabetes as well, the buffalo hunters. Uh, the tribes that don't suffer so much are the uh, mountain tribes that uh, ate fish, a lot of salmon. Yeah. So there's not there's not much fat in the salmon, so they don't have nearly the di diabetes rate that uh, that other other tribes have. As curious, I guess it's not that curious. Many people prefer foods that they grew up with. Uh, that you know people come. Uh, I do have a problem here. I don't eat mutton because I didn't grow up with mutton. I grew up with with pork. Uh, a lot of a lot of. Uh, pig farms around Indiana, uh, bacon, you know, we just ate a lot of pork. We didn't eat mutton, we didn't eat any type of lamb or whatever. Uh, so, you know, that's what we prefer. That's what I prefer. Uh, if I was from Italy, of course, they, they eat a lot of pasta. Uh, they eat, uh, <clears throat> and they, they eat those herbs. Well, some of those herbs are okay for them because they grew up with those herbs, uh, but not not us, not me anyway. I don't know. I can't handle the I can't handle the basil or the oregano. Uh, it's a little bit too strong for me. Um, I grew up in Indiana where it was mostly an English population, English and German. Uh, not a lot of uh, spices, uh, so the Mexican spices kind of burn a hole in my gut. Uh, when I first came down here, I had um, a green chili uh, cheeseburger uh, at Laguna, the Laguna Cheeseburgers. Okay. Oh, God, they're good. They are. Uh, they're really good. <laughs> it's probably because of all the fat, okay? <laughs> there, give, <Yes>. us, <laughs> give us the cheapest hamburger you can, you can find. Uh, but uh, it didn't take very long before the green chili started burning a hole in my, in my gut. I just couldn't digest them. I'm just not used to it. It's not something that I eat. But of course, they eat green chilies all the time. Uh, when I was uh, stationed in Lower Texas, I played on a on a Mexican base a softball team. And when I say Mexican, they were actually from Mexico, and they were not American citizens. They were transients. They traveled back and forth. They, of course, back then the, the border wasn't closed, and nobody cared. And, yeah. and they came over, and they worked. Uh, in Texas, uh, they, usually they were farm laborers, really nice, nice people, really sweet people. <laughs> anyway, so I was playing on this Mexican softball team, and uh, from time to time, people would go down and visit their mothers or their whatever, their families down in Mexico, and they'd come back with peppers. Of course, they came back with peppers. Yeah. Well, some of the Mexican peppers are hot. I mean, habaneros and I don't know. There's, they just, they, they're, they're really hot. Well, anyway, so of course, you know, I'm on their team, so you know, they're, they're just eat, eating away on these things, and they're offering me a, a, a pepper, and, and I'm not thinking, well, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's like a pickle, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not like a pickle. <laughs> and, 
And so they, they offered me this, they offered me one and it was really hot in my mouth and, and you know, I didn't like it. And so as a, I don't know if it was a joke or, or you know, just to show up the gringo or whatever. Anyway, they offered me one from another jar. And I'm not thinking, well, geez, I hope this is milder. As a matter of fact, they told me it was milder. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I, I bit into it, and it blistered my tongue. It was so hot. I mean, it was like sulfuric acid or something. And of course, they're just eating these things like crazy. <laughs> they ate the whole jar. <clears throat> But I ate it and I, I, I blistered my tongue. So one of their wives came over. They saw what was going on. They, were, they used to take care of my kids. I had, I had my son and my daughter. And they would, they would take care of my kids. And of course, they thought that they were just the cutest little things because they had blonde hair and all their kids had black hair. Anyway, <clears throat> so the, the lady came over and she started smacking those guys around. And of course, they're just hiding and laughing and you know, they, she chased them out onto the field and she swore at them in Spanish uh, <laughs> fairly readily. And, and she apologized. It took, it took a week for my tongue to recover. Wow. I couldn't taste anything for a week. I mean, it was crazy. And I had a bad game that day, too. So we lost and we should have won. Anyway, it was their fault. <laughs> but it's okay because because the, uh, the 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 wife she kept she kept trying to find me a wife she wanted <laughs> she wanted to marry me off to somebody it was kind of funny that is funny they were really nice I was their power hitter the little bitty guys uh, all hit singles they all they all hit singles so I was their power hitter big gringo like I'm big. <laughs> well, the reason that they wanted me on their team was because uh, because I had such a high batting average, and because I was like them. So you know, I looked more like them. They didn't want this, you know, great big guy on the team. Anyway, so I got to play, <clears throat> and of course the food was was very much different. Uh, it not only blistered my tongue, but it uh, it gave me a, a case of uh, dysentery. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty bad, pretty interesting. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> people who are drawn to sweet foods and fatty foods because of their taste, uh, because their taste is satisfying. That's why people are drawn to them. Uh, people are also drawn to salty foods because uh, we need the sodium chloride to maintain our homeostasis. So what we're looking for is foods that feed us, feed, feed, foods that make us feel good, and that's sweet foods and fatty foods. So of course that's that's a donut, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. During World War I, uh, the, the, when the, the uh, soldiers were going out to battle, they used to give them donuts. And of course, a donut will sit in your belly and, and feed you for you know, 24 hours. You're, pretty, you're good to go. Wow. Uh, people who are hyperhydrated uh, might actually crave salt. Uh, so if you've ever craved a bag of potato chips, it's probably because you had been drinking enough and you might be hyperhydrated. People develop, develop taste aversions to food that poison them and make them ill. Uh, and this is known as a taste aversion. Most toxins, of course, are bitter. Uh, and for that reason, we don't like bitter foods. Uh, some people suffer from, if you want to taste a bitter food, just, take, just bite into a pill sometime. Because almost all pills, even aspirin, yeah. has a pretty bitter taste. Uh, some people suffer from neophobia. They, they don't like new foods, so they eat the same thing over and over and over and over again. One of the hormones uh, released in the stomach and intestines is cholecystokinin, uh, which uh, comes from your gallbladder. So if you have a gallbladder operation, uh, you lose your cholecystokinin, in which case you can't... Uh, digest fat as well as you could before if you lose your gallbladder. Cholecystokinin is released, released if foods have a high content of fat and or proteins. Uh, so anytime you eat a steak, uh, cholecystokinin gets squeezed out of your gallbladder. And that's one of the reasons for having, uh, for having your gallbladder. Uh, individuals that eat a lot of fatty foods or eat a lot of protein uh, will have, uh, will develop 
gallstones uh, because they're producing so much cholecystokinin in and bile. <clears throat> Uh, I was talking to somebody when she was, and she used to eat, what did she say? She ate the uh, really hot Cheetos. I don't know. The really, really hot Cheetos. And that's what she ate. She ate that for almost every meal. And Dr. Pepper. She drank Dr. Pepper and she ate these Cheetos. So it's, that was, that's what she would snack on. She'd get a big bag of these things, eat them throughout the day, and drink the Dr. Pepper, and, and that was it. Well, she had gallbladder disease when she was 15 years old because of her diet. Uh, so, so now she can't eat fat like she used to. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, so what will happen if she eats too much fat is that it'll give her a case of diarrhea because she can't process it. It's the cholecystokinin that processes this food, and she doesn't have that. Cholecystokinin also stimulates the pancreas to release insulin. Cholecystokinin may be one of the satiety signals. We're not exactly sure. The problem is that if we try, if we, you know, people have been looking for um, a magic pill to take their, their uh, appetite away. Uh, well, they thought maybe cholecystokinin would be uh, one, of those, uh, one of those drugs that we could use to control people's uh, uh, food cravings. But it doesn't work because if you, if you just give somebody cholecystokinin, uh, it causes nausea and cramping. Uh, so your gut will, uh, will tie up, uh, which sounds kind of nasty. Yeah. Uh, cholecystokinin in the presence of food activates the muscles of the intestines to work. So what it's doing is the cholecystokinin tells your intestines that it needs to digest food. Yeah. If there's no food in there, then you get nausea and cramping. And that's the reason you can't just give somebody cholecystokinin. Hunger triggers, uh, there are de several hunger triggers. Uh, low insulin in the blood, of course, is an obvious trigger to eat. Uh, you haven't eaten for a while. Uh, your body needs sugar, it needs energy. Uh, so you'll have a low insulin level in your body. Uh, however, high insulin levels do not equate to satiation. Uh, in other words, if you're producing enough insulin, um, and just because you just ate, uh, it, it doesn't tell you that you're, you're satiated, that you, you don't need to eat. Satiety uh, appears to spread over various regions of the brain, including the amygdaloid nuclei, the frontal cortex, and the substantia nigra. Leptin is a protein produced by fat cells that is secreted and informs the brain that the individual has had enough food. Leptin. We all have this stuff in our system. Uh, what they think is that obese people are actually insensitive to lep leptin's message. So because uh, the, the, uh, they, they are ignoring the leptin's message, they still eat to excess. They don't know when they are satiated. They don't know when it's enough. How much is enough? Filling up your stomach? You know, it's, it's, it's all a big question. <clears throat> so uh, these individuals are <laughs> good scouts. Scouts again. Good job. Are you are you all signed up for next year? Yeah. Next yeah, next year. I, I got two classes. Okay. Wow. Drug so use and abuse and two two careers. and two and three sixty. Two oh two? Yeah. Careers. Yeah. And you have one with standing courage and standing. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, there you go. There is no tree. Yeah, Jeremiah's a lot of fun. I don't know about standing courage. He's from Kenta. Everybody from Kenta is just there out there somewhere. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, when leptin reaches the hypothalamic arc, arc, arcuate uh, nucleus, it suppresses the release of several peptide neurotransmitters that induce eating. One of them is neuropeptide Y, and the other is a agouti-related peptide. Uh, what a strange name. Do uh, you know what an agouti is? No. I'm going to show you in just a second. Right. Leptin also enhances the release of the peptide alpha melanocyte uh, stimulating hormone, and this is what a, an agouti is. It's a big rat. An agouti. Doesn't that have to look horrible? Yeah, they're like two feet. Mean. They're two feet long. They're huge. They're from South America. Anyway, it's a great big it like a Tasmanian. It's, it's, it's an agouti. So they named that. 
Guys, this is the weirdest thing in the world. They, uh, what they did, of course, they know all the chemicals that are utilized by the agouti. Uh, when they discovered this chemical, they said, you know, that looks like something that we've seen before. Turned out to be the agouti, a uh, chemical from the agouti. You, you can switch your chair around if you want. Anyway, it's, it's a tailless rat from South America. It's the most god-awful thing you've ever seen. How big is it? Two, two feet long, they're about this big. They're like the size of a raccoon. They're huge. They're fast? They eat them all over down South America. They eat them? Of course they do. It's, <laughs> it's meat. Silly. What's wrong with hey, you? Hey, man, it's... It, it, I, I've been <laughs> somewhere. I know, but... I've had monkey brain in Turkey. Ugh. It's real salty. Yeah, brains would be. They're really fatty, fatty too, strange brains are, of course. Anyway, that's the agouti. They realized that it was uh, an agouti-related uh, substance. <laughs> Anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa are two disorders of hunger management that leads to extreme emaciation and even death. Uh, of all the mental illnesses, the leading killer of people is anorexia nervosa, as weird as that sounds. Uh, anorexics commonly, most mental illnesses don't cause death. They don't cause you to either commit suicide or die. Uh, but of course, anorexia, if you, if, if it's not controlled, then, and it's really hard to control this uh, because it's a mental condition, uh, they, they'll just starve themselves to death. Anorexics commonly desire and think about food but deny themselves sustenance. Uh, the basic problem seems to be a distorted body image where the individual sees themselves incorrectly as overweight when they are actually thin to the point of death. A form of body dysmorphia. Uh, and they will starve themselves to death, looking at a select uh, area of their body and saying, look how much fat I got right there. I need to lose that. Anorexics tend to be slender uh, of build to begin with, and the excessive dieting merely adds to emaciation tends to run in families. Uh, usually what we see with somebody who is suffering from anorexia is a mother who is 15% below normal body weight. Was it uh, Karen Carpenter? Like Karen that? Carpenter had anorexia. Usually they die of heart problems uh, because they don't have enough fat around their heart to protect the heart, and so they die of heart attack. This is what it looks like to be anorexic. As you can see, they look, they look like they're, they, they're starving to death, and in essence, they are. Uh, and of course, they can't see themselves, as, they don't see themselves as what, what they really look like. They have a body distortion idea. They, their, their minds distort what they're looking at. Uh, so this individual might look at, at her body, and of course, she's got all these protruding bones, and she might say, my butt's too fat, because that's what they focus on. Women focus on areas of their body that look bad. Men focus on areas of their body that look good, as bizarre as that sounds. So if you, you uh, I, I see this all the time in the gym. You'll see somebody, you know, working on their arms. And, of course, the rest of them, is, they don't have any, any, any striation in their muscles, but they work on their arms. Our lifters. Exactly. got free chicken legs, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Power lifters are fat. They are big, fat guys. And uh, of course, the they have to. It's it's all connective tissue. In order to, for them to lift all that weight, uh, what they have to do is they have to put on body weight. They have to put on body mass, and it's not muscle mass. It's it's fat. So if you watch uh, weightlifters in the Olympics, these guys are pudgy. I mean, they're really fat. Especially, well, they, they need they need stomach muscles. They they need stomach fat in order to to lift or to, to do military presses. You need, you need bulk, and that's, so they don't look good at all. Bodybuilders, of course, are a different story. Bodybuilders are trying to reduce their body fat uh, to make their bodies look, look muscular. <clears throat> another form of body dysmorphia, another form of body, um, uh, their brain's not, uh, not telling them what their bodies actually look like. Um, if you lift weights, uh, you go into a gym, it's a, and it's a powerlifting gym. 
it's, it's a totally different situation than if you go into a bodybuilding gym. Because bodybuilding gyms, they do a lot of reps, uh, so they use wider weights. But if you go into a powerlifting gym, they've got, you know, instead of 45 pound plates, they've got 55 pound plates. Uh, you you know you just, you just snatch it and drop it yeah snatch yeah. and drop it. And there's a lot of dropping that takes place so it has to be a reinforced floor it's really kind of bizarre <clears throat> so anyway um, my son and I lift weights uh, but we're we're more bodybuilders than we are power lifters uh, power lifters are always trying to max out. Uh, they damage themselves a lot uh, because, well, their body, their bodies are not put together to, to, to support that much weight. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they have to snatch it and drop it, drop it really fast. Uh, they, they will, when they do bench presses, they bounce it off their chest. And so they'll get, they'll get like a callus, yeah, it's pretty ugly. So sometimes they'll put a, a board or a, a block on their chest to bounce it off of. It'll have like three spotters, seriously. Yeah, it's stupid. Well, nobody who can lift 350 pounds off of somebody's chest. I mean, one guy can't do it. You need you need a bunch of guys. Anyway, this all has to do with body dysmorphia. Uh, bulimics uh, tend to, to be a little plumper than anorexics. Uh, so if we look at an anorexic and we look at their family, uh, what we see is a lot of skinny people. We see a lot of tall, slender people. And these are the individuals that are more likely to become anorexic. But if we look at uh, bulimics, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, not fat, of course, but they are larger than, than an anorexic. Well, but bulimic, they eat and they just throw it Keep it up. up or they, they, they uh, so take... So they don't get full? They, or, oh, they get very full. They look like they're pregnant. They're so full. But then they make sure they get rid of it. Usually, they, if they're smart, what they do is they eat uh, soft foods like cakes and things that when it comes back up, it doesn't hurt them coming back up. I mean, if you, if you eat sharp foods or foods with edges on it, then when it comes back up, it kind of messes up your esophagus, cuts your, the, uh, your palate. So these individuals tend to eat soft foods. <laughs> Bulimics are able to control their weight by purging the food from their system, either through exercise, vomiting, or laxatives. Bulimics will also go a little crazy from time to time. They eat massive amounts of food uh, in one sitting, and then they'll relieve themselves of it through vomiting. This is known as binging and purging. Uh, you, sometimes they'll eat as much as 2,000 calories. They'll sit down and eat 2,000 calories. Well, your stomach doesn't really hold that much food, can't really hold that much food, so they would get a distended belly. I was with a girl who was like that. Why? Did you well, it? no, she was, she was a model. Oh, okay. She was in the Lowrider magazine. Sure. And <laughs> I saw her do it, I'm like, yeah, it, we're done. Yeah, that's What the fuck, I just spent like 30 bucks at a magazine restaurant, and you just wasted it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you spend all that money for food, and then she goes the, into the restroom and throws it up. Skinny, skinny. And if this is a good way to lose weight, I mean, you, you lose all the all, all of the uh, uh, food right down the toilet. But they, they do eat. They will eat. You just don't. Oh, she, she ate a lot. Yeah. I mean, like, four enchiladas, a couple tamales, a couple tacos. There you go. Oh, I'll be back. I'm going to go. I need to go back. Out of my nose or yeah. whatever the hell. Yeah. <laughs> Powder my nose is is, uh, is uh, bulimic talk for stick my finger down my throat and throw up. <laughs> or the 80s, man. It's crazy. Crazy people. Anyway, so that's some of the nutty people that live in the world. People that want to be slender. Yeah. I've never dated a bulimic. I didn't do it on purpose. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, let's talk about chapter 14. Chapter 14 is about, about sleep. Okay. I know, we don't, you don't realize it. You see somebody and you think, wow, that's somebody I'd like to be with. And then you, you, you're, you get around them and you realize, ooh, they've got some really strange habits. 
It happens. Biological rhythms. Uh, most creatures uh, display a daily rhythm that approximates 24 hours. Uh, for this reason, it's called a circadian rhythm. Circadian just means around. Uh, it's, it's actually an, uh, a preposition that means circa, circa, around. Uh, circa, circa, dia, circa, around the day. Uh, circa, dia, circadian. Uh, and, uh, okay, so animals uh, who are awake at night and, and sleep during the day, uh, like most rodents, are called nocturnal. Uh, that's one of the reasons. The agouti, of course, is... It's kind of an interesting animal because it's a, it's awake during the day. It feeds during. It's so big. And, yeah, there's not a lot that can kill it. Uh, when I was in uh, where was I? For Guatemala. We saw a booty in, in Guatemala. They're really strange looking. I mean, they're two feet long. It looks like <clears throat> looks like a raccoon, except it's a rat. You know, it's just a big rat. And, and they're bold because nothing can kill them except a jaguar. <laughs> nothing else can kill them. Uh, humans, of course. Uh, animals that are awake, and of course, uh, the uh, Inca and the Maya used to eat um, guinea pigs. Uh, so in, anything that is in the guinea pig family, like the agouti, they would eat those too. So this is, that's one of the reasons why they're still around, I guess. Animals that are awake during the day and asleep during the night, of course, are called diurnal. So we have nocturnal and diurnal uh, creatures. Humans, most humans are diurnal, uh, but if you've ever been on the graveyard shift, you suddenly become nocturnal. Yeah, it's not easy to shift from, from nocturnal, to, from diurnal to nocturnal. Doing CQ, then both. It's horrible. I hated graveyard shift. First time I did CQ, I fell asleep. I wake up, I see a full bird. Oh, he goes, congratulations, you got it again. Oh, damn. <laughs> 48 hours old. Four so, it's not right. Why do they do these things to us? This behavior may be controlled through the animal's hormonal uh, structure, uh, and that's why they are either nocturnal or diurnal. We'll talk about why they're nocturnal uh, in just a second. When a creature is not given uh, definite uh, external cues, such as the winner, uh, such as what happens to you in the winter time, they must maintain their own uh, cycle. And this is a process known as free running. Uh, when I was uh, stationed in Germany, we, bunk we had to practice uh, uh, pulling up our, our hospital and uh, setting it up someplace else. It's called bugging out. Okay. And as medics, of course, it's, it's our job not to be on the front lines. It's our job to be someplace where we can take care of patients. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, that you have to be able to pick up and move uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, so what we did in Germany was that uh, we practiced bugging out by um, going into the tunnels. Uh, the Germans during World War II built all of these underground tunnels. Well, of course, they were underground tunnels if they're tunnels. Anyway, they had built all these tunnels in, in the mountains. If you've ever been in Germany, there's a lot of, you know, the, the Harz Mountains and whatnot. Anyway, there's a lot of mountains there. So they built all these tunnels to hide from, from the, uh, the American bombers or the British bombers or whatever. Uh, so they were fairly extensive caves. As a matter of fact, under uh, Tempelhof Air Force Base in our Tempelhof uh, Airfield in Berlin, uh, is this amazing uh, mass of tunnels. Most of them have collapsed, uh, but uh, they're tunnels. And I don't know if you understand, Germany is pretty wet. It's, it's a really wet country. There's a lot of uh, force of the two. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, <laughs> well, I won't go into that. Anyway, okay, so, <laughs> so we practiced bugging out and we went into the tunnels. Uh, the problem was when we went into the tunnels, we were supposed to stay for a week. Uh, so we were in there, and it's cold. It's not very warm. It's like in the 50s. Uh, so it's pretty damn cold in there. Uh, but it's also, the lights were on all the time. They never turned off the lights. If they ever turned off the lights, I mean, it's pitch black. You can't get from one place to the, to the other. Uh, we were all carrying flashlights, uh, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the lights were on all the time. And we were underground for about five days, uh, and nobody had a clue what time it was. 
Um, I can't, I can, my Fitbit works. Uh, I, I, I can maintain uh, the, the correct time on my Fitbit because it's a satellite. It's connected to a satellite. So I know what time it is, and that's okay. But if I just wear a watch, my watch slows down. So if it's a, if it's a you know, it's a winding watch or whatever. Anyway, uh, so while we were down in the tunnels, uh, I can't wear a watch, so I had no clue what time it was. Uh, but my brain is telling me, well, it's, you know, it's, it's in the morning. It's time to go to bed. It's time to do, do this work. The problem was uh, that uh, because my brain wasn't given, given any cues as to what time it was, uh, I, could, I was working you know, 24, 48 hours straight without even thinking. Without, without even acknowledging it because I had no external cues to tell me that it was nighttime or tell, to tell me it was bedtime. It was really kind of bizarre. So, and other people were sleeping like all the time. Uh, they were, you know, they would, they would work for like four hours and then they'd take a, a nap for four hours. And, and these guys, and we, so we were all really screwed up. I mean, by the time we got out of that cave, we were supposed to spend a week in there, but we only spent five days. When we came out, you know, it was it was daylight, and, and people's brains are telling them it should be nighttime, and they were just freaking out because nobody knew what time it was. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so we were on free running uh, time, uh, as weird as that is. Um, we we also used a uh, underground tunnel that the Germans built uh, for our nuclear. Um, response. It was our nuclear response area. <clears throat> we weren't supposed to have nuclear weapons in Germany at the time, but we did, just in case the Russians attacked. This was in 1980. Uh, you remember what happened in 1980? The Russians invaded Afghanistan. Uh, what this else? This is a UXO out there. Uh, I can't normal. It's actually sinks, it's gonna sink some love. A lot of their IDs, their uh, minds are still out there. Yeah, we had tactical, minds. we had tactical nuclear weapons out there, we, and we weren't supposed to. This is Afghanistan, up there is Kyrgyzstan, and then bam, Russia's right there. All right. Uh, the other side of Tajikistan. Right, but that's over here. We yeah. were in Germany, so we had Poland, we had Czechoslovakia. And of course, the Russians controlled yeah, Poland and Czechoslovakia. So I mean, the Russian the Russian tanks were right there. They were they were 50 miles away. Anyway, we had nuclear weapons just in case, just in case we needed. Anyway, there was and there was a, an underground uh, an underground uh, nuclear uh, control area uh, called Neubrücke. It was a whole whole military base uh, all all to itself. <clears throat> As weird as it is. Anyway, okay, so the tunnels in Germany. When an animal, including a man, is allowed free running circadian rhythms with no external cues, they tend to run a little uh, behind 24 hours. Uh, mine was running about 22 hours. Uh, I was trying to figure out what time it was. It's one of the reasons why when we went outside and it was daylight, my brain was going, this can't be right. It should be 4 o'clock in the, in the evening. It should be 5 o'clock. should be just before dusk. And it was like morning. I had lost that much time. Um, with this last uh, falling back, uh, daylight savings time, I had a really difficult time sleeping. Uh, which doesn't make any sense. I got an extra hour. So why in the world am I having so much trouble sleeping? I don't know. I feel tired at 9 o'clock at night. Um, I take a nap, wake up at 3 o'clock. Uh, and then I go to bed. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm having a really hard time uh, trying to figure out what time it is. Because normally, well, my cat, and my cat is too, my cat wakes me up at 6.30 every, every morning so I can feed her. Uh, but of course, now she's waking me up at 5.30 because we've fallen back and she doesn't understand daylight savings time. So my cat and I are having a, a bit of a conflict but the weird thing is that usually she tortures me in order to wake me up. She does horrible things, like she jumps up on my bureau and knocks all my stuff on the floor. That's, that's, <laughs> you know, she's just trying to wake me up. It works. I mean, it works. I try to get up 
Because she, I'm, I'm afraid she'll knock something off and break it or something. You a night sleeper? Oh, uh, I am when the cat is up on the bureau. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm in REM sleep at that point, uh, so I'm not really asleep. I'm, I'm really half awake, uh, and of course, I get up and feed her. But it's been a, we've been, had had a struggle ever since uh, daylight savings time. So we'll see what happens. See if I kill the cat. <laughs> Any cue that an animal uses uh, to synchronize their rhythm is called Zeitgeber. It's a German word that means uh, time giver, Zeitgeber. Researchers have discovered that a small region in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus uh, serves as a circadian oscillator. The suprachiasmatic nucleus triggers me metabolic activity. Remember, most of, of your metabolism occurs while sleeping. So about 55% 55% of the energy that you burn during the day, you burn while you're asleep. And that is to maintain, this, this is your basal metabolic rate, is uh, how much energy you burn just to maintain yourself. Uh, individuals who are obese and can't lose weight, one of the reasons is because the body fat is easy to maintain, is a lot easier to maintain. So they don't burn as much calories during the night as somebody who has a lot of muscle mass. Uh, muscles are a lot more difficult to maintain. Uh, it takes a lot more energy to maintain muscles. Uh, so the basal metabolic rate of somebody who is in good shape is a lot higher than somebody who is, a, is relatively obese. They don't burn as much energy naturally. And this can be a problem. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's easier for men to lose weight than it is for women. Men have a higher muscle mass. Uh, women have a higher fat content. And because of that, it's a lot more difficult for her to lose weight. If we have a 150-pound woman and a 150-pound man, uh, and uh, he, he be, it will be a lot easier for him to lose weight than it will be for the woman because she has to maintain body fat in order to ovulate. Females have to maintain at least 10% body fat in order to ovulate. And this is one of the reasons why women have pockets of fat all over their bodies. I'm saying all over their bodies. They, they maintain more body fat in their thighs and in their gluteus maximus. Uh, they, and of course they have all that body fat in their breasts. Uh, that's, breast tissue is almost exclusively fat. Uh, so for that reason, in order for her to ovulate, in order for her to have babies, she needs body fat in order to do it. An individual, a, a female uh, who uh, exercises excessively and has a lot of muscle mass and has, has very little body fat will not ovulate. So if you've got an, an athlete, a female athlete, uh, who's a runner or whatever she is, a uh, gymnast, uh, usually they don't have, they don't have periods. What? They don't have periods. They don't have menses because they don't have enough body fat to have a, have a menses. Uh, my daughter, um, when she was... What about people that are uh, in the last chapter? What? Oh, you, they anorexic? Oh, fat. yeah, they don't, they don't have periods either. Really? Yeah. Which just makes them really, really happy because, you know, your, your period is, is kind of irritating if you're a female. <laughs> Just ask any. Well, don't. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> no, yeah, don't. Yeah, don't. Don't, 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 don't get into that. <laughs> My daughter, uh, when she was in college, uh, she ran track. Uh, there was a, an individual that was really good on her team who had always been uh, a runner uh, and uh, was skinny as a minute. Uh, she was a, a, a decathlete. Uh, anyway, this lady had never had a period in her life because she had always been an athlete since she was, uh, she, since she was relatively young. She'd been a, a, an athlete, and she'd never had a period. She didn't know what it, was, what it was all about. So here she is. She's 25, 26 years old. She's never had a period, and she gets married, and they want to have a baby. But, and, of course, she's kind of clueless as to what's going on. She's a business major, so she doesn't understand biology. And she's never thought about it. She's never really, she's, she's never really thought about it. So she wants to have a baby, and of course she can't because she's not ovulating. <coughs> anyway, eventually, what? And she, so she and her husband, of course, 
it's, it's like they're clueless. I mean, they're trying to make a baby and she's not ovulating, so how the hell can she have a baby? Anyway, so they get, they get a divorce, they get upset. I mean, everybody gets upset because they're not making babies. And then finally, uh, she, and so she gets depressed, right? After her, she divorces her husband. And she starts eating ice cream or whatever, and she puts on a little bit of body fat. All of a sudden, she has her first period. Well, she calls up my daughter. She says, oh my God, I'm sick. I'm, I'm bleeding. This is horrible. And I've got cramps, you know. And my daughter just laughs her ass off. My daughter's a biology major. She's pre-med. And so she tells the lady, look, you know, I, they were roommates. What's, you know, <laughs> the reason you didn't have a baby is because you weren't ovulating. I don't know why nobody even thought of telling her that. So she, she, gets, uh, she puts on a little bit of weight. To her, which was a lot of weight, but to everybody else, she couldn't see it. Uh, anyway, she puts on a little bit of weight. She keeps ovulating. She meets another guy, and boom, she, she gets pregnant. Yeah. So, so for a woman to, to have a baby, she has to have a certain amount of 10 body fat. Ten percent body fat. Yeah. Which is, I mean, if we wander around the campus, there's almost everybody has, you know, 12, 14 percent, 18 percent, 25 percent. What if you is it is there like a cap? Yeah. To where it it, it you can't. Yeah, you, I don't know. It's been... There's a reason for this. There's a reason why humans can't uh, uh, won't ovulate unless they have enough body fat. Uh, back in back well, when, is it possible to have too much. Too, too much body yeah. fat? No. Okay. No, there's no yeah, that's, that's there's right. no such thing as, as too much body fat. Uh, strangely. <laughs> Uh, but there's a reason why humans ha have this proclivity. It's because when we, back in the day when we were feast and famine, when we either ate or we didn't eat, uh, if you had a baby when you, you uh, didn't, there wasn't enough food to feed the baby, then the baby would have died. It would have been a waste of, of ovulation, I guess, a waste of an egg. Uh, so humans, uh, unless they maintain a select amount of body fat, will not be able to reproduce because they can't feed the baby. So it's, it's the way with all animals. Um, a, lot, you know, a lot of these strays that you see wandering around that are really pretty skinny, they can't get, they won't have puppies or kit, kittens. They can't because they don't have enough fat. Um, <clears throat> we picked up a stray uh, a number of years ago, and it was a female, a little tiny thing. You know, we took it to the vet, and the vet said, well, she's about two years old, and, and my uh, wife asked the vet if, if she had been fixed, and he said, no, she just has never eaten enough to, uh, to get big. And so we started feeding, feeding her, and of course, it was like, in a nanosecond, she got pregnant, of course, <laughs> and had kittens. Because as soon as she put on any, any fat at all, she was able to ovulate. And as soon as she ovulated, she went into heat. And as soon as she went into heat, she got pregnant. Uh, she, and she became a, a, a full-size cat. Uh, but she was just stunted until, until she was able to get food. Anyway, so that's the way it worked. <laughs> well, we're talking about sleeping. Why am I talking about pregnant people? Uh, this suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus is the is mas is the master pacemaker. Uh, lesions of the suprachiasmatic nucleus abolish free running rhythms. Uh, activity in the suprachiasmatic nucleus correlates with your cir circadian rhythm. Isolated su suprachiasmatic nucleus continues to cycle. Uh, if we transplant so a suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, into into another creature. Uh, they will have the rhythm of the donor. Okay, so it, so if we implanted a an agouti uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus into a human, they would have an agouti circadian rhythm. All right. anyway. <clears throat> we normally produce different intensities of electricity in our brains. Uh, right now, we're all awake and we're all listening to what I'm saying. Theoretically, we're listening. <laughs> So we're all putting off beta waves. Uh, when we're awake, 
we have these short, rapid uh, electrical impulses going off in our brain. And this is what it looks like when we are awake. This is what it looks like when we're drowsy. The, the, uh, uh, the electrical waves become taller, just a little bit taller, not a whole lot. But this is awake and this is, is drowsy. Uh, when we're relaxed and drowsy, we will produce alpha waves. And the alpha waves, of course, the, the difference is the height, the height of the electrical wave. Uh, in stage one sleep, we begin producing theta waves, which are even taller. Uh, in stage two the sleep, uh, of sleep, we produce theta waves with sleep spindles. As we can see, what's happening here is we're getting some fairly tall uh, electrical waves, but we get these strange little sleep spindles. What is this? Uh, well, if, if you remember uh, the last time you were drowsy, you were almost falling asleep, all of a sudden you had a uh, fairly vivid dream that lasted two or three seconds. Well, that's what a sleep spindle is. It's throwing a, a story at you. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. If it affects your dream? It is. That okay. is your dream. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's why you're having that, that little buzz there. In stage three, delta waves uh, first appear. Delta waves are good. Delta waves. Uh, are very, very tall, very, very wide waves. This is, uh, this is deep sleep. So you'll start to drift into deep sleep in, uh, in stage three. In stage four, uh, this is stage four right here. This is delta wave sleep. This is where you do all of your uh, body repairs. <clears throat> your body just slows down completely. And you go into a deep sleep. Now the interesting thing about delta four the interesting thing about Delta IV is you can't wake up from Delta IV. Uh, so when you're on guard duty, hopefully you're in either stage one or stage two sleep. If you fall asleep, you're in stage one or two, stage two so that you can wake up. If you drift into stage four sleep, you're not going to wake up. I mean, a bomb can go off, which does happen from time to time, time, and you won't wake up, as weird as that may seem. Because normally what will happen, you are dreaming, and your dreams are fairly realistic. So when, if something happens, you incorporate it into your dream, as weird as that sounds. Mm -hmm. It's in stage four sleep that you do your sleepwalking. You can function just as well as you can when you're awake in stage four, when you're sleepwalking. It's a clear building to my sleep. What? I clear my own house. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it was it was crazy. My ex-wife recorded me. What the fuck am I doing? I I can claim my my rifle like asleep. When you're asleep. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I was trained when I was in the military to uh, sleep with my eyes open. And I I still do that. It just spooks my wife out. Of course, she was she was in the military, but she didn't. She I never didn't pulled guard before. duty. <laughs> why why would an officer <clears throat> pull guard duty? Anyway, so she, she gets really freaked out when I start sleeping with my eyes open. Uh, the last stage, of course, is marked by rapid eye movement, and this is referred to as REM. REM is really kind of interesting. During REM, uh, your, your brain, as you can see, your brain waves are almost the same as when you're awake. And you're dreaming, and th this is when you have these really vivid dreams. Uh, usually they're, they're fantasy dreams. They're really strange. You're flying, you know, or you're falling and all of a sudden you swoop around. You do all kinds of fantastic things. You have your realistic dreams in stage four sleep. The realistic dreams. And this is one of the problems with uh, uh, soldiers coming back from, uh, from, from a combat zone. Uh, they will have realistic dreams and they don't like it. it, it it's not good because it scares them. Usually what they're dreaming about is being scared. This is a time when they were they had really strong emotions. So they don't want to do that again. They don't, they don't want to drift into that, that, that type of uh, sleep. So what they'll do is they'll try to do something to themselves that makes them skip over their delta wave sleep. And of course, drugs work. You know, illicit drugs, uh, alcohol works, uh, so they get drunk as a skunk and then they just pass out. And if they do that, they'll jump, they'll jump over the delta wave sleep and go right into REM sleep. 
However, and so we fit, we finally figured this out, uh, that we had all these guys on with PTSD who were getting drunk every night, or they were taking drugs before they went to bed every night. So what we started, so we gave them a medication that made them uh, jump over the delta wave sleep. Now there's a problem with that. Delta wave sleep is, is where you repair yourself. And what we were doing, we, we were jumping them over that first that first stage of delta wave sleep, which is the most restful sleep that you're going to get. Uh, if you go through one sleep cycle, you wake up and you feel refreshed because you've gone through the delta wave sleep. You've done your repairing uh, in that in that wave. But what we were doing, we were giving these guys a medication uh, that made them jump over delta wave sleep, and they were waking up not feeling good at all. They were not feeling uh, rested. Rest, yeah. yeah. They were feeling agitated because they hadn't they hadn't repaired themselves. But we were keeping them from doing all kinds of odd things. Uh, a lot of times during Delta Wave sleep they would um, uh, if they if they were dreaming about somebody sneaking up on them and grabbing them if their wife tried to wake them up, they would think that she was the enemy, and they would, they would scramble. Are you uh, just subconsciously afraid to do it against the free the wall? Just grab a hold of them, and usually they grab them by the neck. She just wanted to tell me it's fine for breakfast. Yes. Next morning she gets the broom. Hey, it's time for breakfast. Exactly. So what, what, we, what you have to do with these individuals suffering from PTSD was not try to wake them up. Not try to wake them up from the sleep, uh, no matter what what was going on, <clears throat> exactly. Um, so then we gave we gave them medication, and the medication we gave them uh, was forcing them to jump over delta wave sleep. But they weren't feeling good after this. So now now we're we're using different techniques besides that medication, and but we are still giving that medication. Now. In uh, stage one and stage two, the individual is often not aware that they are asleep. They are unresponsive to the external environment. Uh, stage three and four is the most relaxing form of sleep. However, it is during these stages that most people do their sleepwalking and sleep talking uh, early in the night when these stages are, are longer. Uh, so usually if you sleepwalk, you're going to sleepwalk right after you fall asleep. That's when you're going to sleepwalk. Um, if you try to wake somebody up from uh, stage four sleep, uh, sometimes you can get them to move. Sometimes you can, can get them to talk to you, but they're not awake. Uh, once upon a time, <laughs> this, is up, this is up north, uh, there was this guy that was the Montana Gold Gloves champion. Big guy, great, he was, he was the heavyweight. Uh, great big guy, Buster. Uh, Buster was his name. He was, he, I mean, he was just the sweetest guy in the world. But don't get any, go don't get in a fight with him because Buster will just lay you out. out. Uh, he'll he'll just take care of business. So one night uh, he he married into a family and uh, there was a daughter in the family. She was in the eighth grade, and so one night she was screaming in her room. So Buster went to see what was going on. Uh, the girl came came bouncing, bounding out of her room before he was in the hallway. And she came out of her room and she went up to him and she clocked him. She punched him in the jaw. Now, one of the things about Buster was he had a glass jaw. But nobody knew it because nobody had been able to hit him in the jaw before. But she clocked him. She, she dropped him right there. And he was unconscious and he was out for for, for like 30 or 40 minutes by the time, and they called the, uh, the ambulance because he, he wasn't responsive. And it, it, it got ugly after that because she was only in the eighth grade, but they sent her to a mental hospital because they thought that she was attacking him. In reality, she was, she was uh, having a, a nightmare. She was having a night terror. And so she thought he was some kind of monster. But, you know, everybody's talking to her, and they're, they're throwing her in, in a mental hospital, and, and she didn't think about this. Finally, she, uh, later, she came back home. Eventually, she came back home. 
<clears throat> Buster stopped boxing. <laughs> But uh, finally she comes back home and she starts, she, she takes my, she was taking one of my classes. And I was talking about this and she said something really strange happened to me one time. She told me the whole story. But she didn't remember what dream she was having. You don't remember night terrors. You just don't remember them. And, and so we went back over what was going on. That's what had happened. She was having a night terror. And she was responding to what was happening in her dream. And when Buster tried to wake her up, tried to deal with her, she thought he was one of the bad guys or one of the monsters or something. So she didn't need to go to a mental hospital at all. But she'd been there for four years. Dang. I know. She was it, was, it was kind of a strange situation. It was on the reservation. So this had to do uh, with, yeah, this had to do with an IHS hospital. And once you get into the system, you can't get out. And that's what happened to her. Yeah. Anyway, so she couldn't get out. During REM, all movement is suspended. As a matter of fact, you're paralyzed. This is kind of bizarre. Uh, if you've ever had a dream where uh, you, you, you couldn't, not only could you not wake up, but you couldn't move. And you tried to move, and you... You, you can't. <laughs> and you can't, yeah, you're, you're, you're completely paralyzed. One time I was, uh, this was when I was in college, uh, I, was sleep I had, had an upper bunk, and I was sleeping in the upper bunk, and this guy came walking in, he started standing beside my window. Well, the bed was right beside the window, and, and I needed to move in order to tell the guy to leave. I couldn't move my mouth, I couldn't move my body. This guy just kind of stood there, and I'm, I'm trying to respond to him, to get rid of him. Yeah. What the hell are you doing in my room? You know, that kind of a deal. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I was paralyzed. And I, I, I thought I was scared to, you know, I was paralyzed because I was scared. But the reality was, it was I was in REM sleep. And it was a dream. Is and that I, like a, a different from um, sleep paralysis? Like REM and sleep? No, REM is sleep paralysis. So that, okay. During just REM, the you're in sleep okay. paralysis. There was not a man standing beside my door, yeah. my, my window. But here's the bizarre part. I recognized this kid. It was uh, it was a kid from another dormitory, <coughs> uh, and I knew I, I knew him a little bit, not a whole lot. Anyway, uh, so he's standing there, uh, and it's like just before dawn. You know, it's dark. It's really dark outside, but it's just before dawn. It's like five o'clock in the morning. So uh, then he gets up and he walks out, and then I wake up, and then I wake up. So everything's okay. Uh, I went to, to breakfast, and turns out that that guy had committed suicide. So here I am dreaming again about a guy that committed. Was he a ghost or was I dreaming? You know, and why did I dream about him? I'd never dreamed about him before. You know, he was just another person at the college, but here I dreamed about him the the, the night he committed suicide. As weird as that. Because he had the shining. Yeah, exactly. I think it was the shiny, and uh, somebody came and hit my door with an axe or something. Uh, during REM, all movement is suspended. As a matter of fact, you're paralyzed. The heart rate is increased. Uh, the blood pressure is up. Brain activity is at a waking level. Uh, the, the most vivid dreams occur during this stage. And when I say vivid dreams, I'm talking about fantasies. Uh, you have your dreams about reality in stage four sleep. Uh, if denied REM, the individual will uh, begin to act uh, in a psychotic manner. So we can't keep people from but you, going... You can have both. What? Where it's vivid and real at the same time. Oh, sure, of course. Right. Yeah. This is what your sleep cycle looks like. If you can go through one sleep cycle, you feel fairly rested. Uh, normally, if you, when you wake up, you wake up in REM sleep. When, when you're in REM sleep, if you're in delta wave sleep, you can't. You can't wake up. But what if something happens while you're in delta wave sleep? There is a, you, your body does have a, a, a mechanism that will wake you up. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But as you can see, it is in the early part of the night that you do all your, your most restful sleep. 
So if somebody wakes you up at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're not real happy about it, but you get up anyway, are you okay? And the answer is yeah, you're, you're in pretty good shape because you've already gone through two cycles of, of Delta. It's actually happened to me. When, uh, I think it was a PFC, and we had an incoming, right? I mean, all of us were asleep. You know, this is back when uh, Iraq, before they started making hard buildings for soldiers, we mm -hmm. slept like a 20 man tent. So, like literally, we're out there in our boxers, our IV, and sure. our weapon. And I was just. Right. But yeah, it was like uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. Because they have the. I, I think in every war, they have the spring offensive. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, as soon as as soon as the weather improves. Yeah, and that was, that was but yeah, it wasn't like we were in barely awake, but we just put it under our gear and it's like automatic. Except in Vietnam, where they had no winter, so there was no such thing as a spring offensive. They, uh, yeah, they, yeah, they were, they were active all the time because it was all, all close to the air uh, equator, so there was no spring. Effect. Offensive. I know what you're talking about. My brother talked about that in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it was cold, then then they weren't active at all. But there's a there's a certain um, I think it has to do with the um, your religion too. But as long as see as long as you get two or three two two or three or four hours sleep, you're you're good to go. You only need two or three or four hours sleep a night, and you're good. As long as you get some sleep, because you need to repair it to some extent. I do like Ted. Now he's going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I'll. It's crazy. Like I'll, I'll, I'll go to sleep in like, like I said, twenty hundred, mm -hmm. right? And I wake up an hour before class, except for this morning, because I want to register. But I still take a nap during the day. That's okay. No, I mean like a four-hour nap. That's all right. It's okay. If your body needs a four-hour nap, go ahead and take that four-hour nap. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you don't need it anymore. I've been doing this for like going on three your years. Body, if your body puts you to sleep and tells you it's time to go to sleep, go ahead and do it. Because remember, every time you're asleep, you're repairing your body. And if your body needs to be repaired, then it needs to be repaired. It's going to take a couple of years. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, it, it could. I mean, we, we are repairing things that have been broken. But my uh, wife had said, she goes, well, maybe sleep at, during the day because subconsciously you think it's safer. I'm like, that's a possibility. She, she yeah, maybe, she may. Because I did all my, my dirt at night. So, right. at the same time, though, we really have, we didn't, Really, really combat it. We did our raids, right? But when I was regular infantry, oh, it was twenty-four-seven. Sure. Uh -huh. Right. Right. But it was safer during the day. You could see better. Yeah. 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 You don't have to wear those damn goggles, which we didn't have. We the only people that wore those goggles were snipers. That's not fair. As the night progresses, the length of time a person spends in REM increases. Uh, dreams in REM in the first part of the night tend to be realistic, while those uh, toward morning are longer and more vivid. Uh, we really argue about this a lot. Uh, one of the reasons is because everybody's different. Uh, here's Scott sleeps eight hours a night, and then he takes a four-hour nap, four nap in the afternoon. You know, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's well, what I, you I, I would go like every night. Oh, and it may be that, well. that your sleep during the night is not as restful as your sleep during the day. And it may be that your wife is correct, that you feel safer when you can see around you. Uh, we're, but we're all different. Uh, no matter who we are, uh, it, 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 you know, we can talk about uh, people getting eight hours sleep a night, you know, and that's fine, but not everybody does that, or not, not everybody needs that. Um, I was talking to Marius, he's got a son who wakes up at like 2 o'clock in the morning and he, that's when he does stuff. He's, he's just, that is his circadian rhythm. He wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning, but he goes to bed at, you know, 8 o'clock at night. 
and he gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning. This is just the way he is. The, his other two sons, not the, they, they don't do that. They, they go to bed at 10 o'clock, and they get up at 8 o'clock the next morning. But his, his, his oldest son is, is just on a different schedule. So, so my wife is like, even on a weekend, you know, like our daughter's sleeping, whatever, mm -hmm. she'll, wait, she'll be uh, still up at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I get up at six o'clock every morning. <laughs> I get up at six. Yeah, so I wake she, up at six and I get up at six. She's like that. She's like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm like, well, what the fuck is up? And the, that's why this thing is screwing me up because my brain is telling me it's six o'clock and it's actually five o'clock. So I'm getting up an hour early. But she also gets her daughter ready and all that. But you know, the weekend she's open. Of course, that's just the way her brain works. Okay, why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time uh, talking about sleep.